Hello, welcome to the November 14th, The Nutritionist webinar. I'm Marianne Fezenden from AMTS and your English language host. This monthly webinar series is dedicated to providing technical talks from internationally recognized educators for listeners around the world. Paula Torillo from Cordoba, Argentina translates and hosts a Spanish language webinar. Tom Long from Hemingway in China will be hosting in Mandarin and Elena Bonfante will host in Italy. Because we are running this webinar at two times, we have pre-recorded the presentation for our presenter's convenience. He will join us for the live question period immediately following the presentation. Listeners can submit queries through me and Elena in the morning webinar and me, Paula, or Tom in the evening webinar. Later, a complete recording of archived webinars as well as a question and answer session for each will be available on the AMTS website. For those of you who would listen to the presentations whilst driving, we have converted the videos to MP3 files that can be downloaded to your device for offline listening. Those podcasts can be found at the Ag Model Systems website under Resources. This month, we are very pleased to host Dr. Bill Weiss, a professor of animal sciences at The Ohio State University. Dr. Weiss has been on the faculty of the Ohio State Department of Animal Sciences since 1988. The recipient of many awards and commendations, Bill will speak to us today about updated mineral recommendations. Dr. Weiss recorded his talk last week to enable broadcast twice today at 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. Bill will be with us live for the question period. For our audience, if you have questions during the presentation, please type them in the chat or Q&A window. Let us now begin the presentation. Okay. Um, hello, um, I'm Bill Weiss, Ohio State University. Uh, today I'm gonna talk about some mineral recommendations. There's a lot of required minerals. I don't have all day to talk, so I'm gonna talk about some certain minerals that we know new information about her that are becoming more important. And I also want to cover some basic concepts which are true for all minerals. But I will not go into every single required mineral. Mineral requirements. The, the classic way we require, we determine requirements of any, any nutrient is this graph here where we increase supply of a nutrient, in this case a mineral, and we measure something. And we keep getting more and more of the response until a certain point and where we get no further response, we call that the requirement. And then we keep feeding until we get to a point where negative things happen. For minerals, that's called the maximum tolerable level. And, and this doesn't necessarily mean it's toxic, it just means bad things happen. They might eat less, might produce a little less milk. The problem is, there's a lot of uncertainty here. One is we don't know how much, we, we, we might know how much mineral is in a diet, but how much mineral is absorbed is extremely difficult to measure. So most of the time we don't know the true cellular supply. And with minerals, the big question is what do we measure? If we were doing amino acids, we'd measure milk protein, but what's the response variable for minerals? And that's, that's very difficult. So we have a lot of uncertainty under both what we call the requirement, and, and we're being very generous with that term, and the maximum tolerable level. When we have uncertainty, what that means at the requirement end, since it's more expensive to have a deficiency than an excess, we feed more. We feed more than what people recommend. However, we have to remember there's uncertainty at the maximum tolerable level. And with that uncertainty, that should make you feed less. So what I wanna talk about is where in here do I think you should be under various conditions for certain minerals. So the bottom line here is there's a lot of uncertainty and when you're formulating diets for minerals or otherwise, you need to ask yourself this question right here. If I make a mistake, is it worse to underfeed a mineral or overfeed it? And again, Underfeeding is usually worse, but we get in trouble by overfeeding, by overfeeding too much. So in most cases, we want moderate overfeeding, and, and a key word there is moderate. 
the, the 2001 NRC, which is be, being updated right now, um, developed a factorial method for most minerals. It, it's uh, based on a maintenance requirement, gestation, how much mineral is needed to make the fetus or grow the fetus, growth of the cow or growth of the heifer, and how much mineral is in milk. And, and all this is on an absorbed requirement basis. It's not diet. In other words, how many minerals, how many grams of, of calcium is in milk today? That's the calcium lactation requirement. So these are total absorbed requirement. And if we're gonna use absorbed, we have to come up with a way to calculate how much mineral is absorbed. And the old NRC used the term or used numbers called absorption coefficients. They assigned uh, absorption coefficients to basal feeds like corn and alfalfa and to the supplements like calcium sulfate and uh, limestone and and they these are table values these are not not calculated they're not measured these are table values we know there's antagonism I'm going to talk a lot about that in the old NRC none of this was modeled in other words we know sulfur high sulfur diets reduce copper absorption you were just as a user, you were told if you have high sulfur, you need to calculate or feed more co copper. We're starting to be able to develop equations for some of the antagonisms. And of course, there's a lot of interactions. These are really hard to measure. These are not easy to get. And so this is a weakness of the, of the system is these absorption coefficients. But at least it's attempt and an attempt to differentiate sources. So it might not be perfect, but it's better than ignoring variability in sources. Now I'm going to run through a few um, concepts. I'm, I'm, these are for trace minerals, but it's really true for macro, but, but I'd say it's more true for traces. And again, it's all traces. One thing to remember is we, and I'm guilty of this as anyone, we always, when people say how much trace mineral is needed, we say you need so many parts per million or so many milligrams per kilogram in the diet. You need copper requirement is 15 parts per million. And that's not the way we should think about requirements. We should think about how many milligrams a day of mineral or grams per day of mineral does a cow need. And this has caused some problems, especially with copper, when we keep thinking concentrations. Here's an example based on the old NRC, which the, most of the data says for copper is pretty close to being correct. We have a dry cow here and a cow producing 35 kilos, say 70, 75 pounds of milk. Her dietary requirement, if she's dry, she needs 175 milligrams a day assuming normal absorption, and if she's producing 35 kilos, she needs 250. So the lactating cow clearly needs substantially more mineral, but this lactating cow eats a lot more. So on a concentration basis, this dry cow should actually be fed a higher concentration of trace mineral than the lactating cow. If you fed just a requirement, this dry cow would need 14 parts per million, this lactating cow only 10. So for a lot of trace minerals, the dry cow actually has higher dietary concentration needs than a lactating cow. Not more mass per day, but higher concentrations. Another problem, and this is especially true with copper, is when we do things on a concentration basis, we get, in, we get into, in some cases, severe overfeeding of minerals with high producing cows. So here's an example. I have a cow producing 45 kilos, a cow producing 35 kilos with typical intakes. And I'm assuming these cows are both fed the same diet, but they're eating appropriate to their intake and to their milk production. This high producing cow is going to absorb about four milligrams more copper per day than this cow, just because she's eating a few kilograms more feed. So four milligrams per day more copper being absorbed, but she's only going to put out two milligrams a day in, the, in her milk, two, girl, two milligrams more in her milk. So what happens to these extra two milligrams here? Well, it accumulates in the liver and, and two milligrams is nothing, but if you, she accumulates two milligrams a day for 60 days or 90 days, then it starts adding up. 
And so by feeding a single concentration to higher producing cows, we are getting some uh, relatively high liver coppers. So just remember concentrations of some trace minerals actually decrease with increasing production. The milligrams per day increases, but the concentration decreases. Another thing I really want to emphasize here is feeds, the minerals, trace minerals in feeds should be included in formulation. Too many people just say, well, I'm going to put zero parts per million copper for my corn silage or zero zinc for my alfalfa. And, and they put zero in the formulation models because they say, well, these, vari these values are highly variable. Well, yes, they are. And that's the problem. Just use a mean. Don't worry about an individual sample. And then I hear, well, the, the minerals in the feeds, the, the copper in the corn or the copper in the alfalfa, that, well, that's not available. Well, yes, it is available. And in fact, some of the data says the, the minerals in feeds are actually more available than the minerals in the supplements. So these are, these are false. We need to put real numbers in for basal ingredients. Here's some data we published a few years ago. This is something like 10,000, 15,000 corn silage samples. One thing I want to point out is absolutely no sample had zero copper, none. And in fact, 75% of the samples had more than five parts per million. So if you put in zero, you're, you're going to be wrong on, all, on every sample, but you're going to be really wrong on most samples. The other thing to note, though, with these trace minerals is these long tails. And that this is a problem. <clears throat> and this is why if you get a number back from a feed test that is, is 10 or 20 parts per million, and the mean's about six, you have to evaluate that sample very closely. So that is an issue, but it's, that still doesn't justify putting in zero. So what about availability of these trace minerals in, in, in the plants or in the feeds? Well, feeds will have what I, I, I break minerals in feeds into three pools. One is what I call the organic pool. Plants need trace minerals for, for enzymes just like animals. They have some of the exact same enzymes. And so in alfalfa, Four to five parts per million copper is actually associated with enzymes. This is organically bound copper. So this is what you, you spend big money on in getting organic minerals, and you're getting some of those in the feeds. So these should be highly available. There's also a small pool within the plant, within the feed, that's what I call the free metal. It is, if we're using copper, it's copper ion. But it's free metal. This is similar to copper sulfate or the sulfates. It dissociates, so, so this should have reasonably good availability. The issue though is this pool, soil contamination. And this is on the outside of the plant, so it's a bigger problem with forages than concentrates, obviously. And a lot of the, the mineral in the soil is not available. Copper in soil, uh, in, in so soil particles is really not available. The iron in soil is not available. This is highly variable. You pick up a lot of soil during harvest, during forage harvest, you're going to have a lot of this. And so the availability is down or reduced. Uh, there is fortunately a way we can kind of adjust for this soil contamination. And what, what first of all, this with soil contamination, these will be these samples with very high copper iron, oftentimes zinc. So they'll be well above the mean. And those are the samples you have to look at carefully. This, this pool, this high, could be because the, the soil is naturally high in copper and the plant absorbed the copper. Or it could be caused by soil contamination outside of the plant, on the sur plant surface. So we have to be able to separate those because if it's inside the plant, it's available. If it's outside the plant, it's less available. So if it's soil contamination, generally that feed will also be very high in ash, above average ash, and very high in iron, well above average iron. So if you have a, a sample that has, say, high copper, high ash, high iron, you should assume there's substantial soil con constant contamination. And in that case, you'd be better off just using a good mean. 
go to a table value, and if the mean for corn silage is six, punch in six. However, <clears throat> if you have high copper and the ash is about normal, about average for that feed, then you should assume, well, that's in internal copper, it's available, then you should use the real number, assuming you have a good sample. So look at ash concentration in iron, feeds with really high ash and iron, discount the, the concentration of the trace mineral, but don't set it to zero. Go to the mean. Another thing here with trace minerals, we, we mostly concerned with, with availability or, or response to the mineral, but we're, we're finding that the, the source of mineral can actually affect the rumen. This is a study we did last year where we fed two, two diets. I'm not gonna get into the diets, but we wanted diets with very different fiber types. So we had a forage and a byproduct diet. I, I don't wanna go into that. And then we fed trace minerals, copper, manganese, and zinc as sulfates or hydroxies. And they all had about the same concentration. And what we noticed is over here on fiber digestion, <clears throat> this is in vivo, not in vitro fiber digestion. What we noticed is this is the byproduct diets. These are the forage diets and the byproducts at higher digestibility as we'd expect. But in each diet type, the hydroxy, cows fed the hydroxy minerals had higher fiber digestibility than those fed the sulfates. I don't think this is a positive effect of the hydroxy minerals. I think it's actually a negative effect of the sulfate minerals. These dissociate quickly. Copper and zinc are toxic to bacteria. We know we think it's just killing enough bacteria to inhibit fiber digestion a bit. So we need to think beyond just normal responses here. The other thing we found, and more and more people are looking at this now, this again, we did this about a year ago. We fed um, to, uh, the same diet with inorganic zinc, zinc sulfate, or organic zinc. <clears throat> and what we measured, we took fecal samples, and then we looked at the micro, what's called the microbiome. And that's all these bacteria that are in fecal samples or gut samples. And what we found is the cows fed the organic zinc had lower concentrations or lower activity of the pathogen in fecal samples that is associated with digital dermatitis. Um, and what we think is one, we know organic zinc tends to improve hoof health. This is a possible mode of action. So if you feed organic zinc, you reduce the pathogen in the feces, cow steps in, in the manure, it's less contaminated. So this might be a, a uh, one mode of action, but we also have to remember that the gut is a major uh, immune organ, a major immune organ. This microbiome interacts with the immune functions of the gut. So if we're altering uh, the microbiome with source of mineral, that might be one, another reason we see these immune effects. So this is a very active area of research. You'll probably hear more about this uh, in the next few years. So let's get to more specifics now. Uh, in the first column is the NRC recommendations. This is my COP recommendations. These may or may not be the next NRC, but this is about where I think we should be. Um, a lot of these don't change a bit. We, we know about where we should be. I'm gonna spend some time on copper because of some issues with excess copper. Manganese in the previous NRC I think is clearly wrong. This was a, a we used the wrong absorption coefficient. So it's, it's substantially, should be substantially increased. Selenium uh, is regulated in the US, so if you're listening to me in the US, this is the number. If you're listening to me outside the number, outside the US, you should think about this. Zinc's a little bit higher. And these incorporate a safety factor. These do not, so that's, a, that's another thing. NRC does not include safety factors, they leave that to the, the nutritionist to apply. Okay. With copper, the NRC says 10 to 12 parts per million, assuming average intakes for a lactating cow. And these, I'm going to give parts per million, uh, and I know I shouldn't, but I'm assuming an average cow producing 75 kilograms of milk. Copper has been shown to reduce mastitis. It improves immune function, and it reduces retained placenta. So this would say, make sure you feed enough. On the other hand, 
Copper is probably the most toxic mineral we feed relative to requirements. We can see toxic effects if we go two or three times requirements, if we feed it long enough. Other minerals, selenium, for example, you have to go about 10 times requirement before we start seeing things. So there's a toxicity issue, and then we're seeing rather substantial accumulations of liver, of copper in liver of some dairy cows, which may have uh, effects as well, negative effects. So we're, with copper, what makes it even more difficult is we have this fine line between adequate and excess, but there's a lot of real world antagonists out there. And that means we need to feed more copper in a lot of situations. A, a biggie or a very common antagonist of copper is sulfur. <clears throat> this can be found in the forage. If you're fertilized with ammonium sulfate, sulfur levels of forages are high. If you're feeding distiller grains, it has so high salt levels of sulfur. Some of it can be extraordinarily high and some water is very high in sulfur. So a lot of diets, if you include water, are excess in sulfur, and that means you need to feed more. Iron, this isn't a, a real common problem, but some water is very high in iron. Reduced iron, not rust, that can antagonize copper. Cattle that are grazing sometimes eat soil. Soil has clay. Clay binds copper, reduces absorption. And then, of course, high molybdenum. Uh, molybdenum by itself is toxic. High, it's required, but it's also toxic. But when you combine sulfur and molybdenum, you get an antagonism of absorption. So molybdenum by itself is, is a toxic issue, but not necessarily a bioavailability issue. This is, a, I want to spend a minute with this graph. It's a little confusing, so I'm going to work, walk, walk through it. But this is the reason why we see higher and higher levels of copper in the liver. Ruminants are designed to retain copper in the liver. That's the way they evolve. So if, when they get excess copper, they store it. So, and when they're in deficient states, they, they release it from the liver. In this experiment out of New Zealand, they took these cows and before the experiment started, they did a biopsy and measured liver copper. And so these are the concentrations of liver copper at the time, at the start of the experiment. So they have a wide range. These would be considered marginally deficient. This is about where we think they should be. These are not toxic, but these are very high. So we have a range from marginal deficient to very, very high. <coughs> they fed all these cows the same diet at 20 parts per million copper. And for several months, I, I can't remember exactly how many months, but several months, then they did another biopsy and they asked how much did the liver concentration of copper change? And with a few exceptions, most of these livers or most of these cows changed at about four per day, which if I convert this to milligrams, every month, these animals, most of these animals, the liver was going up four to seven milligrams per kilogram in copper every month. The deficient ones were, which is good, but these ones that were really excess also were. And again, there's a few exceptions. But in most cases, these animals just keep accumulating. If you feed excess copper, they just keep accumulating. And the problem we run into is not because you overfed copper for a day or a week, but we're overfeeding copper in some of these herds from the minute the, the, the calf hits the ground, we overfeed it. For years and years, and that's becoming a problem with very high liver coppers on some herds. So how much should you feed? You, you want to feed enough. There's enough antagonisms out there. You should feed extra. And I'm saying in most cases, if there is an antagonist is, is, issues, you should feed about 20% above NRC, maybe up to 50%. So most of these diets for lactating cows, if you use sul sulfates, 12 to 17, 15 parts per million is to me a really good number. If you're feeding organic, a high quality organic copper, it's usually more available than you feed less. So if, if you're feeding a, a high quality organic, you might be down at 1.2, you would not be up here at 1.5. So make some adjustments. If you're paying for higher availability, you can, should be able to feed a little bit less. 
with antagonisms. And sometimes th th this is very, very antagonistic. Some of these sulfurs are really, uh, really high. And you might be at two or three times NRC. You might be at 20 or 30 parts per million. But, but justify this. Make sure you, you, you know, measure sulfur. Um, if you do have sulfur issues, I, I think you should be feeding a highly available copper source, not copper sulfate. And if you're up at these high levels, you should really consider doing some biopsies. These have become relatively uh, simple and not extremely invasive with these little needle biopsies. Um, and again, if you're going to be feeding 30 parts per million, you should make sure that these cows actually need. Selenium. <clears throat> This is the, the, you probably can't even read this. It doesn't matter. These are diseases, various diseases, mastitis, metritis, so on. And this is the risk of a disease. So we want these lines to be as low as possible. This is blood selenium, whole blood selenium. And if you take all these diseases together, what we think uh, optimal selenium status is when whole blood is somewhere between 0.16 and 0.18 micrograms per milliliter. That gives you the lowest overall prevalence of these diseases. So that's really how this requirement was set up. We said, how much selenium do you need to feed to get to this level? And again, this is whole blood, not plasma. So the recommendations, and again, if you're in the US, we are regulated at 0.3 parts per million supplemental selenium. And that's, in most cases for lactating cows, that is adequate. 0.3 parts per million supplemental selenium is adequate for lactating cows. And in most cases, inorganic is fine. Selenite, selenate, perfectly fine. If you have antagonists, sulfur antagonizes selenium. So if you're feeding distillers or you have high, high sulfur waters, get some selenium yeast in there. And I, I say a substantial amount. I don't know the, 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 uh, if there is an optimal ratio, maybe 50-50 selenite selenium yeast but I, I still am going to use a blend but i am going to incorporate selenium yeast dry cows these are if you're outside the u.s you should feed 0.6 because again they don't need that much more but they eat half as much as a lactating cow that's the reason the concentration is higher dry cows should be fed a mix of inorganic and yeast selenium yeast and again i don't know if there's an optimal my default value is 50 50. 50% selenite, 50% yeast. Well, what about the, these comparisons? One is yeast is probably, selenium yeast is probably 20%, maybe 30% more available than selenite, which is a good thing. Selenium yeast is, is a lot of the selenium in yeast is in, is in a compound called selenomethionine. This is stored in muscle, so it builds up reserves. It increases in milk selenium, which is good for us when we drink the milk. It's better at transferring to the fetus and colostrum. And this is why I think dry cows should be fed some yeast. It improves the selenium status of her calf and uh, high selenium colostrum. And there's less antagonist. So this would say selenium yeast is, is better and it probably is a little bit, but remember this, that the vast majority of clinical data showing positive effects of selenium were done with selenite. All the work with retained placenta, all the work with mastitis, or most of the work, said selenite worked just fine. So don't, don't think you have to feed yeast. Selenite works fine in most cases. And this just shows you some work we did quite a few years ago. Um, blood levels, which kind of reflect absorption, about 20% higher with yeast in the newborn calf about 20% higher. Colostrum was about twice as high with yeast, and that's why selenium yeast really should be fed to, to dry cows to improve colostrum. But this is the clinical mastitis data. <coughs> the control diet, no supplemental selenium, mastitis over a period of time increased about 5%. If they were fed the same amount of selenite or selenium yeast, uh, mastitis dropped 10%. No, no clinical differences here. So selenite works fine, but there are some reasons um, you, you should, should feed some yeast in situations, certain situations. <clears throat>
manganese. I'm going to be quick here because manganese has very low toxicity, which means if you if in doubt, just feed a little more. There's virtually no risk of toxicity. This is the NRC. Again, I think it over un, overestimated, excuse me, underestimated absorption. Oh, overestimated. It was saying these cows were absorbing more than they really did. Manganese has very, very, very low bioavailability. So this is the NRC. There's data out of Hansen's lab saying if you feed this concentration, you're going to get clinical deficiencies in calves, not, not marginal, but clinical. And in some work we've done, we've done two experiments on this. We keep coming up with numbers between 30 and 40 parts per million is adequate to maintain manganese balance in, in lactating cows. So that's where the 40 parts per million comes from. Zinc, not much new in zinc. Uh, I think the, the NRC probably is very close to being right. You need a safety factor. And again, somewhere around 20, 25% extra to me is a good number. That's going to put you in the 50 to 60 part per million range for lactating cows. This is a big question here. And, and if organic zinc is more available, should we feed less? And I don't know right now. When we see these data, with with microbiome and some other things maybe there's a factors effects of organic zinc beyond better absorption so right now i'm i'm leaning toward if you the same concentration whether you feed organic zinc or inorganic zinc or in other words i'm not going to adjust for high higher bioavailability of the zinc Um, for macro minerals, I'm only going to talk about a few here. Mag magnesium, we've got some new data on that. I want to talk a bit about uh, uh, potassium and a bit about sulfur. Okay, phosphorus. There's in, in the U.S. There's environmental issues on there's high, high pressure to feed less, but on a strictly cow basis, anywhere from this range is fine. Feeding right at NRC up to maybe uh, 1.7 times NRC. It doesn't affect the cow one bit. It affects how much phosphorus is excreted in manure, but it doesn't affect uh, the cow. So you need to pick the range relative to uh, requirements and cost. So there's two points of view here. One is feed right at requirement. You'll reduce phosphorus in manure. There's no, no data showing any benefit, reproduction or production to feeding more. And if you're buying supplemental phosphorus to feed more, you're adding cost. It can be substantial cost. So this, this stuff would say feed right at requirement. <clears throat> However, there's, uh, the counterpoint is there's data saying if, the, if you're 15% less than, than NRC, you can lose milk. So that's not much of a safety factor. And let's not forget phosphorus isn't necessarily an environmental pollutant. It's a required nutrient for plants. And so if you have the land, I'm gonna argue high phosphorus manure isn't an issue, just fertile, use it as a fertilizer. If you have the land that you can manage it. And then a lot of diets, high phosphorus diets are actually cheaper than low phosphorus diets because the phosphorus is in byproduct. So take into account environmental issues and other things but um, don't be afraid, afraid to overfeed phosphorus if you can manage the manure. Potassium, NRC is at about 1.1. We know feeding higher than that increases milk fat. This is likely decad, not phosphorus. I'll get into that. It helps with heat stress. And this, I think, is more, not so much people always said they sweat and, and you lose phosphorus or potassium in the sweat, that which, if, which happens, but high K diets, high potassium diets make cows drink a lot. They urinate a lot, so they drink a lot, and that can transfer heat out of the body. And then there is just some data saying maybe NRC isn't optimal for uh, maximum production or this level. The bad, though, is K is clearly antagonistic to magnesium, and if you feed more K, more K goes out into the manure. And that builds up K's in, in plants, which for dry cows can be detrimental. So there's good and bad. And I, I, my recommendation is kind of a compromise between the two. <clears throat> 
This is data out of Rich Erdman lab in Maryland. Um, he did a bunch of meta-analysis, and this is looking at DCAT, which in the, these slides is sodium plus potassium minus chloride plus sulfur. So the DCAT is increased by either feeding things like sodium bicarbonate, potassium carbonate. And what he found in this meta-analysis, this is milk fat percent. As you fed a higher and higher DCAD, you got an increase in milk fat percent at a slope of about 0.1. So, and then milk fat yield, and, and this is pounds, as you fed higher and higher DCAD, you got more milk fat, fat in pounds. Increasing DCAD is expensive. You have to feed bicarb or cal potassium carbonate. These are not cheap supplements. So even though you get a benefit up here at six, 700 uh, uh, DCADs, uh, economically, I don't think that you can justify that, but a lot of cases you can justify three or 400, and that'll be above basal. You, you have to feed uh, either sodium bicarbonate, potassium carbonate to get up here. So increasing milk fat with supplemental K if it's in a form like potassium carbonate. Potassium chloride, doesn't change DCAD and won't, should not have an effect on milk fat. And again, sodium bicarbonate does the same. On the negative though, is this is the effect of dietary K on magnesium absorption in cows. There's been two, two big studies looking at this or quantifying this. We did one several years ago with North American diets. Joan Weil did, did one a few years back with European diets, more grass, more out corn silage and alfalfa. And this is the slope. So as in our study, as you increase dietary K for every one percentage unit in dietary K you increased, you drop magnesium absorption seven and a half units, seven and a half percentage units, huge difference. The European study got about half the effect, 3.1, still, still negative, but only half as much. The likely reason these slopes are so different is in the European study, the average dietary magnesium was 0.45. In our study, it was 0.27. So you overcome potassium antagonism simply by feeding more magnesium. And I think that's all that this is showing. Higher magnesium reduces the negative effect of K. It doesn't eliminate it, but it reduces it. <clears throat> So again, high K diets, you have to feed more magnesium. So what, where should you be? In most situations, I think around 1.4 is a good number in K. Hot environments, 1.75, and this again is to increase urine, actually increase uh, water intake, to, to transfer heat from the body out into urine. Um, DCAD increasing K can increase um, milk fat and it can increase uh, intake a bit, but this is likely a DCAD. If you're going to go up here, you've got to feed more magnesium. I'll get to that in just a minute. And remember that feeding more K means more K in manure. That's going to increase the potassium concentration of the forages grown on that, that um, soil. Magnesium. This is NRC. Uh, I think you need to feed substantially more because of potential antagonisms. And, and the more we learn about magnesium, I think we're learning it does more than we used to think. So instead of 0.15 to 0.18, somewhere around 0.2 to 0.3. 0.25, again, is a very good number. Again, the reason I, I think it should be higher, we have antagonism with K. A lot of our diets are higher than 1.1% K. Feeding fat, combine magnesium, reduce uh, absorption. This, the interaction between potassium and fat, or excuse me, between magnesium and fat occurs in the rumen. Magnesium is one of the few minerals that are absorbed in the rumen. So fat can antagonize magnesium absorption. And then rumen degradable protein, for reasons we don't exactly understand, Diets very high in RDP reduce magnesium absorption. This is a major problem with very lush uh, pasture, high protein, lush pasture. And we see a lot of clinical magnesium deficiencies and it's because of high rumen ammonias. There's some data out there saying feeding more than this can increase milk fat. 
there's this issue of uh, our main source of supplemental magnesium is magnesium oxide. And the quality of this is highly variable. So you might not be getting the, the magnesium you think. And that you, there's no nutritional risk here at these levels. It's going to cost more money, but there's no negative effects at this much. So that's why I, I tend to feed a little bit more magnesium. <coughs> Another thing here, these are the absorption coefficients from NRC 2001. It assigned feeds a basal availability of about 16% or 0.16. Good magnesium oxide uh, probably at 0.5. Magnesium sulfate at 0.7. There's been a lot of studies on magnesium since 2001. And because of all this data, I could re-derive these absorption coefficients. Basal feed of magnesium is actually better than we thought. It's about 30 <clears> percent, <throat> excuse me, about 30 percent available, but it's highly variable, and this variability is likely due a lot to potassium. On the other hand, good magnesium oxide is only 50 percent as much as good as we thought. We used to think it had a bioavailability of 50 percent. It probably is only 20 to 25 percent available. Magnesium sulfate, we used to think was 70% available. It's only 35 to 40%. So the bottom line, feeds are better, supplements are worse. So you take, take that into consideration when you're formulating. And remember this very, very high variability in basal absorption. This is an old study, but it's still a very good study. Four different commercial magnesium oxides. These may or may not still be available, I don't know. And it just shows the range in availability. The best one was given a value of 100%. It's not 100% available, but on a relative scale, it was given 100. The worst was only 10% as good as the best. So if the best is 25% available based on the previous study, this stuff here has availability of 2 to 3%. So if you don't know what you're getting, uh, you have to supplement more. So uh, there's not a good test for this. Buy magnesium oxide from someone you trust, a reputable source. Uh, here's some new data we just, uh, experiment we just finished. <clears throat> we fed high K diets to get antagonism. We fed high magnesium to counter some of this antagonism. And we fed either mag sulfate or mag ox with or without menensin. And this is a, a moderate dose in the US. What we found was with magnesium oxide, feeding menensin significantly increased absorption of magnesium. It went from about 16, 18% apparent absorption up to 24. This is a very, very big response, positive response. But on the other hand, when we fed magnesium sulfate, we saw almost the exact opposite feeding menensin significantly reduced magnesium absorption. We think this has to do with potassium ions. <clears throat> we don't know, but uh, potassium sulfur uh, uh, ions. So what this does, or what this raises the question of, is we, we typically don't feed mag sulfate to lactating cows. But it's very common in dry cow diets. We also feed menensin in dry cow diets. So... Magnesium is critical to a dry cow, so this would raise a question is whether you really want to feed mag sulfate to dry cows with menensin, or if you are, you might need to feed substantially more. So this, this needs further investigation with dry cows. This experiment used lactating cows. Uh, sulfur here, um, mostly this is the NRC, and this is where it should be. This is enough. Mostly with sulfur, we're worried about negative issues. Too much sulfur reduces copper, and again, now I'm considering water as well. Too much sulfur reduces copper, reduces selenium, reduces DCAD, which for a dry cow is good, for a lactating cow isn't so good, and it may reduce the availability of manganese. So sulfur has a lot of negative potentials or negative effects. This is a study with beef cattle just showing the negative effect of high sulfur on copper. They fertilized uh, pasture with ammonium sulfate to increase forage sulfur from 0.2 to 0.5. These animals were just grazing. These are beef cows, grazed for a couple months. 
and look at the, di the difference in liver coppers. In the high sulfur forage, you're approaching uh, a marginal deficiency with the sulfur, this high sulfur uh, forage. So be aware of these negative effects of sulfur. And another thing to remember here is these diets had normal molybdenum. Sulfur by itself is very antagonistic. You do not need high molybdenum. This shows the effects of sulfur, 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0.6 percent sulfur on selenium absorption. Negative, negative effects. So high sulfur, negative copper effects, negative selenium effects. And the, the negative effects start happening a little bit above 0.2 percent. And I mentioned water. We, we should be sampling water once in a while. And based on average water intakes for an average Holstein cow, if your water has 250 parts per million sulfate sulfur, that's like adding 0.1 units to the diet. So if your diet was 0.2% sulfur, she's drinking this, she's actually getting a diet equivalent to 0.3% sulfur. At 700, it's like adding 0.3. And, and pay attention to the units here. This is sulfate sulfur. Some labs report sulfate. So pay attention to the units. But high sulfate sulfur water reduces copper, selenium absorption, and other issues. So to wrap up here, there's a lot of uncertainty in, with mineral nutrition, both supply and requirements. And so this uncertainty justifies moderate overfeeding. You should not be right at NRC. You should be above NRC. But I want to stress the word moderate. And moderate, in my opinion, is somewhere 20 to 50 percent NRC. I still see a lot of diets where people are feeding two and three times NRC. That's too much in most situations. You do have to adjust these safety factors. They're specific to the farm, for example, a farm with high sulfur water, you have to have higher safety factors. They're specific for the mineral. You might have a zero safety factor for phosphorus, but you might have a 30 or 40% safety factor for copper. And they're mineral source specific. Again, with organic trace minerals, I tend to feed less. I have a smaller safety factor because I'm using the improved bioavailability of the organics as my safety factor. And especially with traces, don't forget the effect of long-term overfeeding. We're not talking about overfeeding copper for a week or two. We're talking about overfeeding copper for months and months and months. So be aware of what the effects of the long-term effects are. Cows are designed to accumulate a lot of trace minerals in their liver. That's the way they're designed. An important point here is give feeds mineral, give the minerals in feed value. Don't put in zeros. If you don't have a good data, if they're all over the place, go to a good table and use a mean, but do not set them at zero. That uh, uh, accounts for a lot of overfeed. On magnesium, there's new data on this that simply says that the supplemental magnesium, magox, mag sulfate, is not as good as we thought it was. It is less available. But on the other hand, the feed, the magnesium in feeds is better. So this may not change the diets a whole lot, but if, if you have very low basal magnesium, you might have to supplement or you will have to supplement more supplemental magnesium because you're not getting as much available magnesium as you think. And then lastly, and this is kind of in its infancy now, but source of trace minerals, and this is organic versus others, it's probably bigger effects than just absorption. That's for the long time, we just said, oh, organics are more available and that's their value. But the more we learn about these, these things and especially within the gut, uh, it's likely we're gonna see find more and more differences uh, between organics and uh, sulfates. Looking at, at the gut, this is more than just bioavailability. And with that, I thank you, and uh, that concludes the seminar. We thank Dr. Weiss for that presentation. He has now joined us for questions.
So if you in the audience have questions, please be certain to enter them in the chat window or in the question and answer tab. We will alternate questions from my webinar with those of our co-hosting countries. First, we need to do a few housekeeping details. Let's talk about next year. In 2019, we have many exciting topics and speakers lined up. We will have a growing animal mini-series with a focus on calf feeding, robots, post weaning, and heifer requirements with talks from Vin Amberg, Akira Sato, Drake Lee in that area. Other focuses will be on forages with Rick Grant and about pastures from Irishman Mike Deneen, a PhD from the Van Amberg Lab. We will talk about fats, optimizing, and practical feeding. As always, we hope to supply you with the information you need when you need it. So suggestions are very welcome. We are shifting the day to Thursday and will continue to offer the talk at 9 a.m. and 5 or 6 p.m., Daylight savings time always messes with our routine schedule. Our first presentation will be February 14th with Rick Grant from the Minor Institute. I invite you to join us for the last Beef Nutritionist webinar with Dr. Nicholas DiLorenzo from the University of Florida this afternoon at 1 p.m. This webinar was rescheduled from October. Dr. DiLorenzo was in the path of a massive hurricane that devastated his area on the original date of October 10th. His campus has only recently regained power. His talk will be on improving forage utilization while minimizing environmental impact, likely valuable for both beef and dairy-focused nutritionists. If you are interested and have not yet registered, contact me at webinars at agmodelsystems.com. Our beef webinar is presented in English and Spanish with Paula Torillo co-hosting from Argentina. We are thankful for our series sponsors of AMTS and AB Vista for the English language webinar and Rock River Lab and Bio4 Argentina for the Argentinian webinar. This is our last webinar in this series. Finally, I would like to thank my co-hosts and the people who have made this webinar possible. AMTS, USA and Global, Paula Torillo in Argentina, and a special thank you to Rock River Laboratory for sponsoring the Spanish language webinar, and Tom Long, Hemingway in China. Elena Bonfante joins us from Dairy Innovations in Italia in Italy. We are especially thankful to the generous sponsors who make it possible for us to get great speakers and manage the program this year. We thank our gold sponsors, Ajinomoto Heartland, Superior Nutrition through Amino Acids, makers of Agipro L, and Arm & Hammer Animal Health, makers of cattle feed ingredients that optimize dairy cow health. Our silver sponsors have been Dairyland Laboratories, Virtus, makers of Strata with EPA, DHA, Omega-3s, and Prequil with Omega-6s, Cumberland Valley Analytical Services, Kemen, featuring USA Lysine, Dairy One Forage Laboratory, R&D Life Scientists, and AB Vista. Our bronze sponsors this year were, were Amino Max, Purdue Agribusiness, Jeffo, Quality Liquid Feeds, Adiseo, Origination Inc., and Novita, makers of Nova Meal. I'm now going to open the floor up for questions. To the English language listeners, I'll read your question. Remember to type your question in the Q&AB tab or the chat window. Thank you, and let's begin. We do have some questions starting off, um, so I am going to pursue through them as I'm able. And again, to all of you out there, if you have any questions, go ahead and type them either in the question and answer tab or the um, chat window. I don't care which. I'll read them. So today, um, I'll start off with a question from Jim Aldrich, and I'm appreciative Jim always asks some really great questions. Um, the first one will be, will the fetus accumulate copper to the extent that a newborn will already have to extent that the the newborn will already have high liver copper levels when gestating cows are overfed copper and, yeah jim does ask good questions yeah the fetal accumulation especially during the dry period um it is proportional to intake by the by the mother so if we overfeed the dam, the fetus will also accumulate copper in its liver. 
it won't it probably will not approach toxicity issues, but it will be born in, in very good status. Perhaps excess. We don't really know what's excess in a fetus, but again, uh, fetal accumulation is proportional to maternal intake of copper. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll move to another question from Jim. Um, is the RDP effect because of NH3 being a base and raising the rumen pH? Magnesium absorption, is it higher at lower rumen pH? The, I'll answer the second question first and then get to the first one because that's, that's harder. Um, yeah, as rumen pH decreases, magnesium absorption from magnesium oxide increases. But within the range of, of normal rumen pHs, I, I don't think that's a big deal. If we were to compare, say, feedlot cattle uh, rumen pHs, which are going to be in the fives, to dairy cattle, which would be around six, we'd see improved absorption by the beef cattle. But within a, a reasonable range in dairy cattle, I, I don't think it's a big deal. But yes, as rumen pH decreases, magnesium absorption increases. The, the RDP one is very hard to, to determine because, or the cause of that, is because it appears to be acute in that we, we put cattle on, a, say, a high urea diet or a, a pasture diet where, where RDPs become very high in a short period, magnesium absorption decreases markedly, can even cause clinical uh, magnesium deficiencies. But over a few weeks, cattle adjust. In other words, high RDP for several weeks, the magnesium absorption returns to about normal. Whereas with potassium, they, they never adjust. It's always antagonized. So the, the mode of action is a little confusing. It could be the, the pH. I don't think that's a, a big enough difference. Uh, ammonium is an ion, a positive ion, and, and magnesium absorption depends on electrical potential. So that could have an effect. But again, that doesn't explain why they adapt. So it might be some microbiology, microbiological adaptation, a population change. So the, the, the bottom line is we really don't know the mode of action of high room and ammonia. There's several possibilities, but the acuteness or the, the lack of a chronic effect is really hard to explain. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll go to a couple questions in the chat window. The first one being from Andrea Bellingeri, and he says, um, where is it possible to find literature focused on trace mineral sources for dairy cattle feeding? He's looking for papers, book, extension articles, etc. Well, the, the Journal of Dairy Science, uh, every year there'll be a few papers on, on trace minerals. Most of these have to do with sources, organic versus uh, sulfates. So that would probably be the, the best source for scientific papers. Uh, we published um, out of our lab several review technical articles on, on trace minerals. It would have um, some things on sources. They'd be available at our website. Uh, I can make sure Marianne knows it. Um, extension, uh, in the U.S., it's Dairy E Extension, um, or, um, has some, some papers on, on trace mineral recommendations and a little bit on sources, but for, for the scientific, the most, most of the papers would be in Journal Dairy Science, but there's also every year a couple papers in animal feed science and technology that have to do with dairy cattle and trace minerals. It's, there's not a lot of people working in this area, so there's not going to be a lot of papers, but every year there's a, there's a handful of pu publications. Okay, excellent. And I'll get that list of links and I will add them to the email that will go out to all of you with the recording link. Um, moving on to more questions. First of all, uh, Rizi Lofty, Latfi, and I hope I haven't really killed his name too much. Um, first of all, thanks you very much for your presentation. And he asks, what minerals do you think have more role in ruminal mineral fermentation in the future? Well, the, the macro minerals are, are needed by, by bugs as well as cows. But 
on, on the macro minerals, we pretty know pretty much know those. That there there's a some more knowledge to be known. But to me, if you're around NRC and all, that's gonna do the bugs as much good as as we think. The the areas that need research that we're learning on is the trace minerals and bacteria need copper zinc manganese selenium just like like we do or just like cows do but with the tools we have now and I, I'm not a molecular person but with the molecular tools we have now it's getting much easier to study these broad effects on populations on on metabolism on bacterial metabolism so I think we're going to see a whole lot more on the trace minerals, and, and copper is a big one. It, it clearly is toxic to buck bacteria, but it's also required. So that's one is interesting because a little bit too much, you have problems, and not enough, you have problems. Uh, zinc is also in that that area where it's not as toxic to bacteria, but but it clearly has activity to bacteria. So the, the two minerals I think are most interesting with microbiology or rumen microbiology is copper and zinc. And again, we're just now starting to really re, re-study how these affect the, the rumen population. Accumulating data says um, the sulfates are likely more toxic to bacteria than we thought. That may be a potential reason some of the organic or specialty minerals do a little bit better than than the sulfates. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see. This is from um, Paulo Marcello, and he asks, "How um, does organic minerals increase milk protein?" It, it that that would not be a a, a common finding. Um, trace minerals you know assuming you're about at requirement it is not going to have a huge effect on component yields or milk yields if it were to increase milk protein it would almost have to be via ruminal metabolism um, and if if these trace minerals would in, increase uh, rumen bacterial metabolism that increases microbial protein synthesis and it increases metabolizable protein reaching reaching the mammary gland. So that would be the, the biggest thing. Some of these organic uh, trace minerals are chelated to amino acid. You could say, well, maybe that that that's the effect the amino acid is getting to the mammary gland, but usually the amount of the amino acid is is pretty small, so that's unlikely. So I'd say in general, I wouldn't expect huge changes in component yields with with organic trace minerals, but if it did, it's likely a change in rumen metabolism. Thank you. I'm going to jump ahead to a question that we had at the end while we're a little bit on the discussion of butterfat. So um, this is from Justin. He says, in higher corn corn silage diets, would dietary sulfur levels at 0.25% be helpful. There is a belief out there that this would benefit butterfat production, not hurt it. What are your comments? Well, at at 0.25 uh, sulfur, that's I, I don't think that's a, a problem. It's it's close enough to requirement. Um, uh, one thing we have to remember is in most diets we do not measure sulfur. We are using book values, and. Corn silage has changed over time. It's getting uh, lower and lower in protein, um, and protein is where most of the sulfur is. So it might be we're, we're not feeding it. We're not supplementing enough sulfur because the basal levels are, are low. Um, one of the effects of a sulfur deficiency is reduced fiber digestion that can affect uh, a butter fat. So Inadequate sulfur uh, can affect butter cat, butter fat. Excess sulfur can depress butter fat, and this is this decata thing. So 0.25, if you get a positive response to, to 0.25 sulfur, it's likely you've corrected a sulfur deficiency that's caused by underestimating basal supply. Um, but be careful, because again, if if you increase sulfate without sodium and potassium, uh, 
that can affect DCAT. So if you're feeding sodium sulfate, potassium sulfate, that's, that has no effect on DCAD, that would be probably a better, better source than some other types of, of like calcium sulfate. Uh, you don't affect the DCAD that much. Thank you. A couple questions about selenium. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. This is from Angelo Griano. About selenium requirement, um, Dr. Weiss said for dry cows, only outside the U.S. at 0.6 parts per million, but a mix of um, but use a mix of inorganic and organic sources. What would be the mix suggested? I, I get that question a lot, and the answer is we don't know. Uh, people have not looked at that. What the reason I like a mix is one is. Um, Selenium yeast clearly is better at elevating fetal selenium. There's no question on that. But selenite does some things on immune function. It, it induces some immune responses that the yeast probably does not. So the mix, I think, is just kind of an insurance policy. The other thing is we know selenite clearly uh, uh, works on retained placenta and immune function. Since I don't know the right mix, I usually tell people 50-50 selenite yeast, or for a dry cow, maybe 75 yeast, 25 selenite. But that's a guess. But I, I would go at least half yeast and maybe uh, more yeast than selenite, again, to ensure that the fetus is getting adequate selenium. It also helps really elevate colostrum selenium, which again will help help the calf. Okay, um, a, sel a selenium question from Tom Taluki, and he sent this in advance. He said, um, with selenium, how can you recommend 0.6 parts per million when legal limits in most of the world is 0.3? It's even worse in Japan where the 0.3 parts per million applies to grain mixes, not the total diets. So all these animals are actually lower than 0.3. Is there enough data for countries to consider to reconsider the legal limits it's uh, first thing you have to follow the law so uh, yeah. and that's why i said outside the u.s so follow the law and the other thing to remember is that's for dry cows we should be regulating on milligrams per day not on concentrations and 0.6 for a dry cow is about going to be about six, six or seven milligrams a day. 0.3 for a lactating cow is plenty. That's going to be six or eight milligrams a day. So I want to be clear, it's just dry cows. Um, and there's probably not adequate data to, for the regulators because we're stuck at 0.3. We can make a good case that cows need six to eight milligrams a day, but it, it's, I, I do not think there's adequate data for regulators. They always err on the side of, of safety. In a lot of people, though, a lot of places, somewhere around this six milligrams a day is adequate. So people blame selenium for lots of problems without really ensuring it's a selenium issue. So Take, take some blood. Blood is a good indicator of selenium status. If, it's, if plasma's around 0.07 micrograms per milliliter, you're, you're fine. And in most cases, 0.3 parts per million selenium uh, in the lactate cow will do that, probably not in the dry cow. So I don't think we're going to convince regulators to change. Look for high selenium feeds if you can. Um, if you need selenium, injections might be a possibility if it's allowed. Um, and that's we're, we're stuck with that. Thank you. Um, now I have a non-selenium question. Um, are all trace minerals not selenium absorbed as ions? This is from Jeff. Or do organics have a proven alternative path, pathway of absorption that is different, for example, in, through an amino acid, et cetera? If historically we thought all non-selenium organic trace minerals and organic had the exact same absorption mechanism, it dissociated in the gut, 
and it was absorbed as the ion. And most of the data still suggests that. However, there's some data with cells, not animals, but with cells, suggesting that some of these organic trace minerals are absorbed as the complex, not as the, the, the metal, which would then explain some of this uh, improved absorption. It could also mean that that mineral might be metabolized differently. There's data with cells on zinc, um, organic zinc being absorbed differently than, than uh, zinc sulfate. I'm not aware of any data with copper. And that's why I tend to hedge my bets a little bit here. With organic copper, I, I still think the vast majority of that effect is absorption at the gut level between organic and, and sulfurs, sulfates. The zinc, there's effects there we can't explain because of bioavailability. So that might be, if it is absorbed as the complex, that might explain some of these effects we're seeing. So yes, there's data uh, with cell culture work showing a difference in absorption. It needs to be done in, in whole animals. And it's only, to my knowledge, been shown with zinc. So this is, an, again, an area that needs more research because what we were taught 15, 20 years ago apparently is not totally correct. Okay. And I might just mention selenium. Because of the structure of organic selenium, it is absorbed as methionine. There's no, no question on that one. But that's actually part of the molecule. This next one is from Oswaldo Rosendo, and he says, Good morning, Dr. Weiss. Thank you for your seminar. At Venezuela, most of the commercial mineral mixes do not have potassium. Can we use potassium carbonate, which is used as a fertilizer, to supplement lactating cows? Uh, yes, you can, assuming there's nothing else in it, you know, that would not be acceptable for cows. So if it's fertilizer grade, it might have some other things in. So make make sure there isn't heavy metals and other things. But but potassium carbonate is a very, very good source of potassium. It If all you need, though, is potassium, potassium carbonate is a much more expensive source of K than, say, potassium chloride. So I'd explore that if all you're looking for is potassium. Potassium carbonate is good because it changes DCAD in addition to being a good source of potassium, whereas potassium chloride only provides potassium. It doesn't change DCAD. So either one of those sources are very good. Look at cost and ask, what, what do you need? Is it DCAD or potassium? Potassium carbonate uh, is, is, is a very good source of K, but it is more expensive than K chloride. Tom, you want to go ahead and ask your question? Okay, my question is, um, in order to track the, uh, how the animals are doing with um, um, trace metals in the body, um, in, in addition to the uh, liver biopsy, is there a need to track the uh, um, metal content in the manure? Or uh, anybody doing that at all? Okay. Um, me measuring trace mineral status is extremely difficult with the exception of selenium and we, we talked about that copper the the gold standard for copper is liver liver copper mm -hmm. uh, for zinc and manganese we really don't know we, we don't know what a good liver level level is we don't know what a good plasma level is uh, manure or fecal or manure uh, trace minerals will tell you almost nothing because almost all the trace mineral that a cow eats ends up in manure. Uh, copper, maybe 5% of it might be absorbed, maybe. Manganese, a uh, half a percent. So most of what you, within the uh, precision we can measure, uh, a lot of times Manure has the same amount as feeds, uh, if you're correct, for digestibility. So manure, I don't think, would tell you a thing. Milk isn't very good. Um, liver is still our best indicator, and that's really only valid for, for copper, 
the rest, it's pretty much you look at the diet. If they're up around requirements, you have to assume it's about okay. But we, we just don't have good status indicators for, for or good marginal status indicators for zinc and manganese. Mm -hmm. Can I ask another question? Yes, go ahead. Yes, uh, right now in China, uh, we are short of uh, dairy cows, so um, a lot of ch companies are importing thousands of thousands of um, paper cows from Australia. So during the transition for cows that came from uh, Australia and uh, now they landed in China, in terms of uh, metal uh, management, what's your advice? Well, a lot of the effects of, of trace metals or, or trace minerals on dairy cattle are immune function and health. Mm -hmm. And the, the transport transport stress is a major uh, effect and it's it's been shown with beef cattle anyway. Zinc, copper, and selenium, cows that are, are animals that are in adequate selenium, copper, and zinc status uh, undergo transport stress better. They can handle it better. And, and there's no reason to think dairy cows would be any different. So it would be important, one, to, before those cattle ship, they're in good status. But I'd also think hard about giving them, um, giving them adequate mineral when they, when they are arrived. Uh, injections okay. are very good. There's injectable um, copper, zinc, and, and selenium. Several products out there. I won't recommend a specific product, but there's a lot of high quality products out there uh, that will, in the short term, provide a good boost in, in mineral status. So, uh, adequate status before shipping would be ideal. And then once they get their uh, uh, an injection of, of, of trace metals may also be useful. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Tom. Shall I pass it now to Paula? Sure, go ahead. Okay, all right. And yeah, don't hesitate to let me know if you have more questions. Sure. Um, Paula, it looks like you have a few queued. Do you want to go ahead? Hi, yes, I have a lot of questions. Hi, Bill, how are Hello. you? How are you? Very good, thank you. Nice to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, the first question is uh, from Matias. Uh, he wants to know some recommendations on minerals and vitamins on growing hyphers. The, the, their, their needs are much less um, than a lactating cow. So on a concentration basis, you should be, uh, on copper, I'd be right at NRC. There's no reason to go any above under most conditions. Um, zinc, growing animals do have, have a good need for zinc, so maybe a little bit of an a increase in NRC for zinc. Uh, manganese would be 30 or 40 parts per million. So generally, NRC for lactating cows is adequate and I'd probably cut back on the safety factor because because heifers just don't don't need that much. The macro minerals, uh, there's no evidence to suggest NRC is is wrong for for heifers. I'd stick pretty much right to NRC. For vitamins, um, we don't know a lot. If if they're grazing animals eating good green grass, they don't need supplemental vitamin E. Uh, if they're outside in, in bright sunlight, they need very little vitamin D. They need a little vitamin A. So again, I'd, I'd start at NRC and probably no safety factor. Uh, again, heifers are not undergoing the stress or the metabolic uh, demands as a lactating cow. Okay, thanks. Another question from, uh, this is from Uruguay, Betiana. Regarding magnesium in lactating grazing cows, we have some cases of down cows and we estimate they are caused by magnesium deficiency. What would you do in those cases? Uh, pasture is, a, is a, a risk factor. Grazing is a risk factor for, for magnesium deficiency because these pastures generally are high in K, low in magnesium, and, and high in protein. 
for the, those animals, they should be supplemented with magnesium. Um, point two to uh, if you estimate pasture intake, point two to point four percent of total diet should be magnesium. The problem is is getting them to eat it. Um, magnesium oxide is not very palatable. If you're not feeding much grain, intake is an issue. Uh, mix it with salt. Uh, they will eat salt, but uh, they, cows on grazing should be fed supplemental magnesium. Um, it's just absolutely critical because of the potassium problems. But point, point 0.2 to point 0.4% uh, will, will be adequate even under those conditions. And, and I might add again, quality of magnesium oxide if, is if if it's not available it won't help so make make sure you buy uh your magox from a reputable uh, seller okay the third question is from leo he says in cordoba and santa fe provinces we have some farms with 2000 ppm sulfates in water besides trying to change the water source what would you recommend on copper, selenium, and magnesium? Okay. Um, 2,000 parts per million, and I'm assuming that's sulfate, not sulfate sulfur. Um, if it's sulfate sulfur, that's around 700. And that's, that's you can handle that. Basically, you would be feeding uh, copper up around 20, 22, 20 to 22 parts per million of a high available copper, so, so not copper sulfate. Selenium, if the law allows, at that level, you need to be feeding about 0.5 to lactating cows, uh, and that should handle that, that uh, antagonism. If, if it was 2,000 parts per million sulfate sulfur, which is very, very high, um, that's going to cause all kinds of problems, um, intake and everything else. But at, at 2,000 parts per million sulfate, it's basically increased copper, switch to organic copper, and increase selenium if the law allows it. If the law doesn't allow it, you're going to have to consider injections. Right. Uh, I have uh, the fourth question is from Javier. Many trace minerals, copper mostly, have a positive effect on milk yield. Why does it happen if insulin is supposed to provoke a competitive effect? For energy between different organs and the mammary glands. Well, m most of the data doesn't show much of a production response to supplemental minerals, su supplemental trace minerals. Um, just be, be because it's it's there's not that much of these minerals needed for for metabolism. The animal is very good at conserving this. The benefit if you see one, is most likely reduced mastitis, uh, improved health, not a direct metabolic effect. Uh, the studies with copper that have shown uh, uh, an increase in milk production usually shows a very significant reduction in cell count, somatic cell count. So most of the response, if there is one, to production is likely improved health, not a metabolic, uh, metabolic effect. Okay. Question number five from Leo. May liver biopsies help in high water sulfate cases to help to decline, to define, sorry, copper supplementation? Yeah, liver biopsies, if, if you are suspecting a copper issue and you're feeding pretty high copper, um, I would take some biopsies. Uh, the, the, uh, I, I can't go into the procedure because I don't know the details, but the, the way it's done now is pretty non-invasive. It's a needle biopsy. They don't need much liver. Um, and these vet, vets are getting very good at that. So before I start feeding 25, 30 parts per million, I take some liver samples and see. If they're low, then 
feeding 20 or 30 parts per million is, is a good idea. If they're already adequate, then obviously you don't, don't uh, need that much. So before you, uh, routinely, if you're down in the 15 parts per million, I don't think liver biopsies tell you much. But if you're having issues with high sulfur water, molybdenum, other issues, and, and you have reason to suspect copper problems, may, maybe increased mastitis, increased infectious disease, uh, do some biopsies. That's a good way to either rule in a copper and you, you modify supplementation, or if, if your livers come back fine, look for some other issue. So it's, it's a very good status indicator. One, one caveat, though, is it, you, you have to biopsy healthy animals. Sick animals uh, change, liver, liver concentrations of copper can change very quickly with sick animals. So don't biopsy sick animals, biopsy apparently healthy animals. I have a question from Pedro. What could be the cause of the different effects found on different sources of magnesium oxide? It's likely magnesium oxide is a manufactured mineral. It is not mined. And, and to make magnesium oxide, uh, I, I think they start with magnesium carbonate and they have to heat it to, to very high de temperatures, several thousand degrees for a certain period of time. If it, and that's called calcination. If they heat it too much, it's not available. And if they don't heat it enough, it's not available. So one is, is it just not manufactured correctly? Uh, the other big one, and that's hard to determine by, by looking at it. The other big one is particle size. So if, if your magnesium oxide is in, in big chunks, obviously it'll be less, less soluble than if it's finely ground. So look at particle size, but that doesn't tell you if it was calcinated correctly. And there's really right now, there's not a good lab test to say this is good magnesium oxide and this isn't. So like I said, buy it from someone you trust. Okay. Uh, the other question, it is known that selenium, copper, magnesium, and zinc are essential minerals for enzyme synth synthesis that help to reduce oxidative damage. Could we measure oxidative damage as an indirect measure of these trace minerals concentrations? There, there are several lab tests that measure oxidative stress. Uh, and there are some, some lab measures that measure oxidative damage. So, some of these tests are easy enough that could be commercially applied. Some are so difficult they, they can't be. Uh, they're strictly research tools. The problem is, though, oxidative stress is a balance. It's antioxidants versus oxidants. And you, you could have, for example, an infectious disease, an inflammation, you're going to see oxidative stress. The minerals might be fine. It's just the, the inflammatory response overwhelmed it, and that's, that's very common. The, the other thing is, or another thing, is there are lots of antioxidants. Uh, metal, metal enzymes make up some, but there are many, many, many uh, antioxidants. And so, you know, your metals might be fine, and you've got, say, deficient, or so for some reason the cow didn't make enough vitamin C. That's the problem. Or, or um, not enough vitamin E. So the, the oxidative stress measures would, would tell you or may tell you, you you don't have enough antioxidants. It won't necessarily tell you you don't have enough minerals. And the other thing to remember is excess metals, especially copper and a lesser extent zinc, actually increase oxidative damage. So, so theoretically, you could do that test and say, I've got oxidative stress, feed more metals, and make it even worse. So it, it really is not a good measure of, of trace mineral status. Okay. Well, um, I think that brings us to the end of the questions.
Um, as Dr. Weiss stated this morning, he's going to provide me with some um, information about where we can find out more information about um, mineral nutrition. And he'll send some links to me so that I can pass them on when I pass on the recorded links. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining us. Dr. Weiss, thank you. It's probably been a long day for you. And I appreciate, yeah. no. appreciate all the questions you've fielded. Um, I know we had a lot of interest in this webinar. Uh, just to let you know, we, we certainly had people joining us from China, Australia, Japan, uh, the United States, South America countries, um, all over the place. We had some South Africans this morning. Um, I think Europe must be all occupied with um, Euro tier, but we did have an Englishman in this morning. <laughs> so, all right. Okay. Uh, I, I want to thank Dr. Weiss. We, we had uh, people here uh, joining from Uruguay, Chile, Argentina, of course. Many, many of the questions, you, you know the people. Yes, I do. So. <laughs> yes. <laughs> The names, you may, be, you may remember the names because they always ask questions. Yes, yes. yes, I, yes I remember that very well. So. Yes. But th th thank you. Okay, thank you very much. All right, and, and we have a thank you from Australia. So I don't know my time conversions very well, but I think he must be up very late. Oh, no. um. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you. Ben. All right. Kai, um, I also have a shout out to you from Michael Deneen. It's it's 930 in the morning. I don't feel bad for him at all. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> he should thank be going to work ones. then. <laughs> all right. All right, everybody. Thank you. And we look forward to seeing you in February. Yeah. All thank right. you. Thank you, everyone. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Bye, Tom. Thank you. <laughs> Bye, Dr. Weiss. Okay. Bye, goodbye. Tom. Thank you again. Yep. I'm going to end this. Okay. <laughs> Good night. <laughs>